welcome back to my channel. My name is David. Today I'm going to show you how to build this dynamic fashion e-commerce website using React.js. When you look at this website, first when you look at it is the banner page. On the banner page, you will see this uh, uh, moving carousels with a swiper that shows all the catalogs of our fashion items. So when you click on one of those items, you will see the background image and also the content text changes accordingly. Let's try. So you click on this one, you will see everything changes. And you click on the next one, you will see the text font change. Also, the, the number changes, the background image changes. So this one is entirely dynamic and also swipable. So when you put your mouse on it, it's entirely swipable and it's also automatically moving. Okay, so that's one of the, the key features of our banner page. And the second key features of this banner page is that when you look at this red button, I give you this black one, the red button, if you click on it, it allows you to access that specific fashion item. So we click on this one and it leads you to the next page where you will see the details of this item. So on the left hand side, there's a four empty blocks, which I left intentionally for you to put in your own customized images. So because this uh, video is for demonstration purpose, so I only use one main image for each item, but you can add more images if you want. So the key thing to demonstrate here is that we'll see the, the details of this item, the price, if it's on discount, the current price, and also you, you are allowed to select the size of this item. Imagine that this is a fashion item that sells clothes and uh, maybe shoes or clothes or t-shirts, whatever you want to put in. This allows you to choose the size so you can put in the size you want. And also it allows you to change the quantity. So you can click on the, the plus button to add it to two or the minus button to reduce it to one. Minimum buy is one, so but you can uh, keep increasing it. Magically, when you select the size and also the quantity and you want to add to the bag, the shopping bag, you click on the add to bag and you will see on the top right corner, the bag number has increased to one. Okay, the bag number has increased to one. And you, you click on that shopping bag icon, it will lead you to that shopping bag page and you will see the item we just clicked on. So that has the quantity of five, which is large size. That's the original price up to timing five and the 50% discount. This is the final payment. Okay, and it also calculates the total for you. So because we only have one item, the total number, the total amount of payment equals to that amount of payment of that individual item. However, if we go back to the home page and let's say we choose the second one and we want to shop now and we choose the extra large, give a quantity of two, add this one to back, just staring at this icon here. Right now it's a one. So, but after I uh, click on the add to back, so this number increases to two, which indicating that there's a two items in our shopping bag. Okay. So now let's click on this icon. And when it goes to that shopping bag, you will see there's two items, uh, which uh, separately shows the details of each item you just added and the size, the quantity, all correct. And magically, you will see this total amount has add up the, to the total payment of each individual item. Okay, so this is the uh, shopping bag, like a shopping cart that we build. Um, and you are allowed to remove the item you don't want. So you can click on the, the remove the garbage button. So that one gets removed and that one gets removed. So now you empty your shopping bag. Okay, this is one of the key features. The second, the third, the third feature of our banner page is you see this plus bookmark sign here. And when you select any individual item, the change not only changes the background, the text, and also the content, then the number, but also it allows you to click on this add on button to your bookmark, which is your liked collections. So when you click on this one, you will see that color stay, it stay at red, okay? And then you will see the number of your liked item or your collection bag increase to one. Let's try another one. Say, for, for example, this one is a number seven. And then when you click on this one, that stay at red and this one increase to two on the top right corner. And um, if we click on this collection icon, you will see there's a two item has been added in, which is the two we have just clicked it, okay? So this allow you to uh, collect the item that you favor for now. And it also down the corner, down the right bottom corner, it allows you to go to that shopping page to see the details of that item, okay? And you can add to bag over here. So it's only one place allow you to add to bag because when the user want to add item to the shopping bag, it, it must confirm the, the, the size of that item and also the quantity of, the, of that item, okay? So it's not, a, a proper idea to do the adding to shop cart right over here on the card. So we do a, uh, a access direction. All right. And also on the top right corner, there's a bookmark sign. It allows you to toggle on it. So if you click it again, you will see nothing disappear. Basically means that you do not want to collect it. And again, nothing disappear. So now your collection is empty. 
All right. So go back to the home page. We'll see that uh, this banner page contains many, many fancy features, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in this video. Not only the shopping cart, the collections, also the dynamic animated background and also the font. OK, and also if you click on that animation, you will see that this navig navigation button allows you to lead to the next section, which uh, in this example template, I only build two items, one for women, one for men. But if you um, got my template or you want to build on your own, you can add more navigations you want. Just create a separate page for, 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 uh, for this project, for demonstration purpose. And I only designed this type of card to illustrate the details of each item. And you can see on this card, it also contains the details of that uh, fashion items, uh, which shows if, if it's a spring item or the summer item or the winter fashion item. Uh, if it's on sale, uh, if it's a hot item, what's the price of it? If it's on discount, what's the original price? How much you save? Etc. Etc. Okay. So on each card, if you click on the shopping back icon, it takes you to that add to back page. All right. So back to the home page, going to that uh, section there. And this is the women and the, the men. The women and the men are the same because we only have eight items in total. So and by the way, um, all the data I use in this project are dynamic data. They are coming from this backend, which I built on localhost while using something called um, JSON server. We create a JSON file and we serve it as a backend API. So it's actually uh, mimicking a real project. In a real project, this is exactly how you fetch data from the backend API. All right. So we have all of our eight items uh, stored here from the backend API and we fetch data from this page and then render it on our um, UI, on our React UI, the browser. Okay. So and then Last but least is the footer. We have a beautiful footer set up to finalize the home page. So if you click on the um, the round button at the bottom right corner, it, it takes you back to the top. All right. So in this example, I'm going to show you uh, all of these features uh, step by step. Um, the focus of the project is on the React or JS structures, how you create a component, how you um, build pages, how you use different React hooks and also uh, how you use a uh, different third party NPM libraries to support your project. Um, we're not going to focus too much on CSS and the layout of the website. Um, so I'll illustrate the focus with more time. Uh, when it comes to CSS, I'll copy and paste the CSS code explained for you as well. All right. So if you're very excited about your project, uh, please subscribe my channel, uh, like it and share it. Let's go ahead and build it right now. So to quickly start up this project, you're just going to open up your terminal on your uh, a computer. If you're using Mac, just op um, open up this Mac terminal and type in npx. Uh, if you're using Windows, it's the same type of code, exactly the same. npx create React app, and then the remaining part is going to be your customized project name. Here we just say e-commerce website. So once you key in that project name and you just hit enter, uh, this thing will build a project for you inside that directory and I'm going to pause this video for now. Once it's done, I'll go back to it. All right. It looks like this project has been successfully built. What I ask you to do is that you're going to change the directory to that folder and then you're going to npm start a project. Okay. So what we're going to do is that we change uh, CD means change directory e-commerce website. Oops, made a typo. Get in. So once you get in, uh, instead of uh, starting up the project here on the outside terminal, I'm going to open up my uh, uh, code editor to start up this project. So we say code period, hit enter. So now this project gets opened up on your code editor and we can set up the project there. I'm just going to expand this, but it will say the bigger. To open up the terminal in your code editor, you just hit control back tick on your keyboard and then you say npm start as how you've been requested. Hit enter. Hopefully this thing should be run on your local host 3000. Yeah, it has been successfully run. You can see that the rotating spinning button, uh, the spinning logo, which is the built-in React logo. That means that the project is working. And here it says that uh, it says some problems for us to build. We need to um, add this thing to our dependency. That's okay. I'm just going to copy and paste that. You might encounter this error. You might not. It's just uh, depending on your personal computer. So I'm just going to open up a new terminal and say npm install that one there. Hit enter. So it's very quickly it's going to be installed. Close off this one. Going back to the original terminal, everything works fine now. Okay. So if you do not have that yellow warning, just ignore this part. 
Very quickly, I'm just going to go through these folders for you. If you are um, React beginners. The, mod, the node module holds all the dependencies going to be used in this project, but there's nothing for you to worry about because this thing comes in with the project already. But do not delete this folder, otherwise it won't be working. Okay? The thing we do need to focus on is the public folder. Inside here, we have our index.html files. This file will eventually be rendered on our DOM. It has all of those metadata, the head, and also the key part is this, div id equals to root. This part is going to wrap all of our React code inside this div tag okay so to quickly clean up this file i'm just going to delete all of those comments because they are useless and uh, take quite a lot of space so i'm just going to quickly delete all of these and this tells you you need javascript to run this project of course we know that it's a nonsense so delete that and here you probably want to uh, change your um, app name by saying this is going to be an e-commerce uh, website app so that's going to be good enough so this is what we're going to do for the html and other things inside the public folder you don't have to worry so much about it you can just close it off for now the most important things for you to look at is the source folder because inside the source folder we have this index.js file and this file will eventually be compiled and wrapped into this index.html file okay these two are linked together but what you can do is to delete those uh, comments and the second thing for you to look at is the app.js. Eventually, all of those things that we write must be wrapped inside this app component for it to be wrapped again inside the index. You see, this app.js gets exported here and gets imported over here and then wrapped inside index.js. The index.js gets uh, compiled and put it into our index.html and eventually put it onto our browser. That's the way the React works. Okay, very clear and very simple. Close this off. And so far, if you look at a browser, it runs the uh, building logo. Well, I want to try something customized, which is ourself. So I'm going to delete all of those app building stuff. And I'm just key in something like a hello. Hello world. Let's see if it works. Going back to the browser, you see nothing shows there. Basically means that our projects are working all okay. And if you want to have a look at the app.css files, this is the original CSS that has been used for the previous page, which are useless. So delete all of these. Index.css files, which has some building code as well, delete all of these. So these are useless because we're going to use our own CSS later on. Here, since we have removed our logo, the logo import is unnecessary. Remove that. So everything becomes much nicer. Going back to the browser, everything is working all okay. All right. So this is the first step. Just introduce the, the files and folders. The next step is going to install the dependencies. To know where the dependencies, we want to have a look at the package.json file. Inside this package.json file, you will see that all of this stuff are the dependencies used in this project. And this has been pre-installed, come with the, come with the uh, Reactor project. But we do have some third-party dependencies to be used, and we haven't installed yet. So to do so, I'm going to open up the terminal again. Do not touch the original terminal because this terminal is used to hold your browser. Open up a new terminal. It's in the same directory. And then we're going to say npm install, i for install. And a couple of things we're going to install. First thing is called bootstrap. And also we need the bootstrap icon. And also for this project, we need the React Router DOM. Because we are building a multiple page project, not a single one. So we need a React Router DOM. We also need a carousel, as how I show you in the introduction video, introduction part. We need something called a swiper. So, so far we need those couple of things. That's going to be good enough. And you hit enter. Uh, this will install those dependencies for you. Just pay attention to the package.json file. Pay attention. Yep, it comes real quick. So once it's all installed, you will see this uh, dependency list gets updated. The bootstrap is in, the bootstrap icons there, and also the reactor or the DOM, the swiper, all there. Okay, that means that you, these things have been installed successfully, and supposedly they are added into your node module as well. So the node module will hold all the dependencies you installed here. All right. So that's what it is. Another thing I wanted to install, I'm just going to clean that. It's called npm install JSON server hyphen server dash g. Uh, the reason to do so is because in this project, we're going to use a mock server um, to hold our 
um, API endpoint. It's like you have a backend code, right? So and we're going to fetch data from the mock API. So the JSON server is used to uh, create that mock API, but you have to install it globally for you to use in the project. If you are using Mac, you probably want to type sudo before npm, S-U-D-O, and then you need to key in your password before you can install it. Once you install that, later on you can watch your server uh, when it comes to that step. Just pay attention to this. I'll show you again when it's come to that backend code. Okay? But so far we are good. We're good to install just few of these. And once it's done, uh, close this one, leave the browser one on, just uh, turn off the terminal, and the package.json all good, and we start to build. Okay? And to think about how do we build this project? This project, um, it has that uh, the banner page. If we're going back to the browser, the layout of it is supposed to be, we're going to have a header right over here. And we have our logo, we have our navigation, we have a couple of icons. And down below, we're going to have a banner section. So the first thing we're going to build is the header and then come with the hero part, which is the banner, right? So we're going to focus on those things first. And going back to our code editor, before we start to create a component, I'm going to do some general settings for our app.js file. And I'm just going to copy and paste in the general setting and explain to you, to make it real quick. For this project, we are going to use uh, a customized font from Google Font, which is called Great Wipes and Roboto. So if you go to Google Font and search this to add it to your card and import it, you will have the same type of code as me. This is uh, provided by Google Font, not my customized stuff. And once you've done that, we're going to and make sure that for everything on the page, the margin and padding goes to zero, box sizing, border box. This is the, the place where we define our root color. We have three colors, the primary one, the second one, and our background color. So this is the hex code. You can use the code you like, it's up to you. And for all of those things, we want to make sure the font gets pretty fine, the body's background gets pretty fine, remove the scroll bar, even though we have the scroll behavior, but I, like, I just like to remove the scroll bar, make it look nicer. And then we're going back to the browser uh, and reload it, and you'll see that uh, things have been changed. The background changes, the font changes, everything looks all okay for me now. So that's the first step uh, to make sure you have those general settings. The second step is to create our structure. But before we do so, I'm going to create a couple of empty folders inside a source folder. The first folder is called component. So because we have the customized component, which can be reused across the whole application, so we're going to reuse them and put it into a folder. And another one we're going to do is the page because we are building a multiple page website. Uh, we need a page folder to hold our separate pages. And then if we have some static data, we'll probably want a data folder as well. So, so far, that's going to be the folder I can think of. And outside, just at very outside, we're going to build a folder called API. This API folder is going to hold our JSON file later on and, and to create our mock API endpoint. Okay, endpoint URL. And what I mentioned just before is that the first component for us to build and load it onto our, um, our web page is our header. So inside of the component, header is a component, we're going to build our first one, which is called header. So here we say we create a new file called header, JSX. And very quickly, we're going to create an, another file called header.css. So these two comes with each other. And to create the uh, header component, what we're going to do is to use the shortcut called RFCE to create a boilerplate. This boilerplate is going to use to hold our header component. And we're going to import the CSS file we have just created, which is the header.css. Oops. All right. And then we have that. If you do not have this boilerplate, uh, what you can do is to go to your extension. And you found this one, ES7 plus React Redux that React Native snippet, once you install this one, you will have that RFCE shortcut for the boilerplate. Okay, quite simple. And we have that, we have the CSS comes in. How do we show this thing on our app? So we're going back to our app. Instead of hard coding that hello world, what we're going to do is that we're going to import that header we have just built. We say header. And it has this reminder asking you, uh, are you uh, wanting to import this one? We say tab. Basically means that we're going to automatically import that thing in. So once you tap it, if your automatic importation is working, uh, right above is supposed to import that header component from the components folder. Saved it, and you look at that header. And going back to the browser, you will see that header, that the text word is there. It's not quite obvious. Um, 
if I change this, if I change this to H1, because we have a defined H1 to be a white color. Yeah, change it to H1, it looks much nicer. And it's sitting at the top right, top left corner. It's there. Okay, so the header is in, and the next job is to build it because the header does not just contain that world. Right. And the way to do so is very similar to our HTMLs, like how you build your vanilla HTMLs website. Um, this is, a, by the way, a React course. Uh, so if you have a, no knowledge about the website, know nothing about HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, I do recommend you to watch my previous few videos, uh, which shows how you can build a simple project, or decent simple project with vanilla JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Okay, This is like a, a more advanced course where you do require uh, to have some foundational knowledge of web design. Our focus is on the React fo folders and structures. So inside the header, what we're going to do is gonna, we're going to create a header tag, which is a HTML um, building tag. And inside that tag, first thing we want to do is the logo. So we say anchor tag dot logo. So we create a logo and give the hyphen. This one will give it a logo name, brand name. Wait, I, I just using something really simple called fashion. If you do have your brand name, put it in, or you have some um, brand images, you can li leave the image in here. Just use a image tag, like something like this, okay, to put it in. And uh, the second thing we're gonna build is our navigation, because if you look at it now, we have that fashion thing there, but we do need our navigation. So we're gonna break, uh, build a list and give the class name nav. And inside here, typically, the way we build the navigation is to use uh, a list that contains the anchor tag. Uh, if you, we have a three, we just times three. So this is how we're going to build it, right? The first one maybe you want to use is a home. And then the second one, the third one, that's how you build your navigations in the, in the list. But we are building a reactor project. The reactor project hate repeating. So if you build it this way, you're repeating yourself, your code is not dry, which is not good. So the way to do so, is we have to first create our uh, nav list data and then map that data into our nav list component. And I have prepared that uh, nav list data for you. So I'm just going to copy and paste in into our static data folder, paste in. And let me show you what it is. It's a JavaScript array that contains the JavaScript object. And in each object, it contains the properties of that uh, navigation. It has the ID, it has the link, it has the name. Uh, it has a which counter section is in, what is this the next section, that kind of things. Right, so far for demonstration purpose, I just use the three navigation. In a real project, you might have a few more. If you want to keep adding in, just updating this file. This is the beauty. You don't have to touch the, the JavaScript or the, or the JavaScript code. You just, whenever you want to make the modification, you just need to update your data file. And the entire page will update it straight away for you. Okay, because we're going to do a data mapping over here. How do we do that? Firstly, we're going to have to import this navlist data file right above. So at the right above, we say import and then navlist data. So that thing has automatically been imported from the data folder once it's done. The second thing is that we need to use some local state variable to hold our navlist data. So here inside the React, we say use state because we're going to use that hook. So once we have that, we're just going to build a local state variable to hold our nav list data. We say const nav list comma set nav list equals to use state. And then here we say nav list data, save it. So we have that kind of thing. And once we have saved that data, it means that initially the local state variable nav list will be set to the data from the data list file, okay? And then we're going to do a mapping, map that into our nav list component. This list component is supposed to be a separate component. So instead of writing it over here, we're going to create a separate component to hold it. So inside the component folder, create a new file called nav list item.jsx. So we'll create a new file for it, hit enter. And very quickly, we'll just create a new one called nav list item.css. Enter. So every component is supposed to come with its own customized CSS file. It's a match. Okay. So to create that component, again, RFCE, boilerplate DOM. And then from the header, we're just going to copy one of these 
into our nav list item save it okay and these are useless now because we're going to do a mapping to have all of those things so how do we do the mapping using the javascript the higher order array function map okay we have our local state variable host the host the data from the nav list data which is an array if it's an array we can use that higher order array function by saying nav list dot map and inside here is each nav element we're going to do an arrow function to map it and brackets map it into what map it into our list item which is this small list okay so we say nav list item hold it and then once you map it supposedly we're supposed to see three times of the home yeah we see three times of the home right over here that means everything has been done successfully uh, and because we have three items three objects inside this array and supposedly it should be mapped three times as well okay but this is not finished yet whenever you're using the javascript the higher order function inside of react you're going to make sure that each mapping is unique so we have to create a key for it the key is our nav id this nav refer to each individual object and we can access the property of it id link name current next all of them okay so we use that id to separate them out and the second property i want to pass in for that child component is the nav itself so we pass the nav object itself which is each individual of this object each individual of these as the property into this child component this is called a property drilling okay once this thing gets passed in as a property um, we can consume that property over here so inside the nav list item we just do a property destructuring by say nav so now this thing actually comes from the parents components property drilling you can access that nav object already so inside the nav list item instead of saying hard coding that home what we can do here is we say nav dot name because name it's actually one of the actual thing we're going to use to have the whole navigation list going back to the browser you will see that thing has been mapped successfully we have home women's men's all different dynamic right so this is how it works and this one give it hyphen not much so far let me see so so far we are all good we're all good the next thing we're going to do is that uh, I'm going to put in some CSS because this looks really, really bad. It's just uh, piled up there. I want them to spread out horizontally as a real header. So for that header CSS, I'm going to open it up, drag it over here. I'm going to uh, copy and paste in that header CSS. Quick explain. We want to make sure it's sitting at the top, take the whole width of the screen and uh, really stand out to give a high number of the z index that'll actually overlay all other stuff and this is for when the page gets scrolled the header actually shrinks down a bit this is what it is for the logo give a different font make sure it has a font size properly and also the white color the nav we want to make sure it's a display flex the remaining stuff we haven't got to yet i just leave it there save this one going back you will see that logo is correct but our nav is even correct and still have that bullet point and the under, underscore and stuff so what I will do I'll go into our nav list item.css and copy this one in as well so very simple just remove that bullet point and give them proper font size and color save it and then you're going back oopsie let's see if I have forgot to import that yeah this is uh, what I told you whenever you create an object a, a component uh, right after it you need to import the CSS files otherwise it's very easy to forget it so we say nav list item.css so in, import that into this uh, local component file and going back you will see that thing has been removed off the bullet point but it looks like that color hasn't been changed yet let me see how we forgot any uh, class name for it nope, not any class name because I put this one in the wrong place the nav name is supposed to be put into the anchor tag wrapped by the anchor tag so we can color it so resave it check it again that looks all good and when you hover on it it has that hover effect okay so this is a very quick to build it the next thing is that we're going to have two logo uh, two icons one for the heart the other one for the uh, um, the shopping bag 
So what I will do, I'll quickly copy and paste those in because it's a quite simple stuff. I'll explain it for you. So down here, we're going to create a new stuff called the user items tag. And we're going to have a two thing, uh, two anchor tag. One is called um, icon. So this one I have a class name of icon. You want to give a good icon to use that Bootstrap icon. Uh, firstly, we go to that Bootstrap icon website. You just type in Bootstrap icon on Google. You will find this page, and you find the one that you want to use. And this one I want to use is the heart one. So we're gonna find the heart fill, which is this one. Oops, the heart fill, and then you're going back, paste it in. Make sure this one is class name, not class. But you wouldn't be able to see it because even though we have installed the Bootstrap icon at the very beginning, in the app file, we haven't imported those files yet. So I'm going to go back to our app.js. At the red top, I'm going to import import those Bootstrap thing. This is a Bootstrap. This is a Bootstrap icon. You have to type in those two lines of code for the Bootstrap and Bootstrap icon to work. So now if you're going back, it turns to white because the bootstrap just been added. We have to reload the page for that one to show. Okay, very beautiful. And then that's our first one. The second one is going to be pretty much the same. You can put this one into a separate component actually if you wanted to. <coughs> but uh, I leave this as a practice for yourself. You know, this is repeating as well. It's an icon component. You can actually wrap this into a separate component, put it into a component folder. I leave it for you to practice on your own. I'm just gonna do it this way. And the second one I'm going to find is a shopping bag. So we tap in back and we have that back view. And we copy that. Back to the browser, uh, back to the editor, change it. Okay, so now if we're going back to the browser, we have those two beautiful icons there. The reason why it looks nice is because we have predefined those user items, the user item icons. But uh, one last thing we do want to have is that we need to show the numbers of the item inside each. Okay, the, how many items inside the back, how many items inside our um, like the collection item stuff. So we're going to create a span to hold those numbers. Here we say span give the class name of like. And so far, I'm just going to hard code five because we haven't done a JavaScript yet. Just want to show it. And the second one, we say span, give it a back class name, and I'm just going to say three, okay? And then we save it. And you're going back, you will see the 513 has been shown up, okay? And so far, we have successfully built our header. Um, it looks all okay for me, but the function hasn't been finished yet. But uh, we will come to the functionality of the header when we build the remaining of the project because so far uh, we haven't have enough space or enough chance to use the function. We haven't built the shopping back page yet. We haven't built the remaining page. So even though you click on those things, it wouldn't go anywhere. All right. But so far we have done the header part. This is the way the reactor works. Our next job, I'm just going to close off this for now. Our next job is to build our hero section which is the one that below the header. So let's just jump in and build the hero section now. To create that hero section, we need to first create a few components and pages. And think about it, um, we now have the header, but we, we are building the multiple page website. So when it comes to the banner part or the hero part, it's actually locating on the home page. So instead of creating the hero component straight away, we need to create a page called home inside of the page folder. So in the page folder, we create a component called home, JSX, that's going to represent our home page. And then RFCE to create a boilerplate for the home, and then we have that. And inside this home, we're going to build all components and sections on the home page. This including the banner section, the women's section, the men's section, and any other sections you like. All right. So now we have the home. We need to uh, include this home into our app.js because currently we're exporting the folder's home component. However, we never have a chance to use it. So if you look at the browser, you wouldn't be able to see anything. And to do so, we have to include it here. But the problem with that React 
if you can only have a single component at, in the return part. So if we, let's say for example, include that home straight away here, it will allow you to import from page. You can have that automatic importation, but down here, you will see that red red line below the text words. They're representing the, an error. We have to remove that error. And the way to do so is that we're using the empty angle brackets. This is going to wrap things around and show them as a single component in the return part and control V to paste that. So now we have our header and now we have our home section. If we change this one, let's say I'm just going to use a H1 uh, and then home. Because we have exported here and then imported here, so supposedly you will see that home at the top left corner. That's all correct. All right. So this just means that we have successfully done the, the right job for the home. And the next thing is that we need to create our hero, the banner part for the home. And the banner part or the hero section is not a page. That is going to be the component. So inside the component folder, we create a new component called the hero, JSX. And then very quickly, we're going to create another file called hero same name dot CSS. So these two are supposed to be met together. So RFCE for the hero component to create a boilerplate. And then very quickly, we're going to import that hero CSS. So got this one linked in. And if we have done things correctly, let's just change this one to H1 as well and just put it on hero. How do we take this one to the app? Because the app is going to show the home page. And the hero is one of the components on the home page. So instead of showing the home, what we're supposed to do is to return the first section or the first component on the home page, and that is a hero. So we say hero, and then automatically import that. Close the brackets. This is importation, return it in the home. And supposedly, we're supposed to see that. And you can see that the hero now is sitting at the top left corner, which is all correct. Okay, so all this step is try, trying to show you how the React structure works. The React structure is like you create your separate component. This component can stay at itself separately without any other things. And you export and import this component anytime you want to use them. These things are isolated from the parents and can be reused anywhere you want. This is the banner, probably going to use it only one time. If you create a button or an item card on your browser, those buttons and cards can be reused anywhere you want. You don't have to write a code again. This is the beauty of the React.js. Okay, so now we have everything done. And then the next thing to think about is that how we're going to create the banner section or the hero section. The hero section contains the background image for the web page, but the background image is dynamic. We're probably going to have multiple product items, and each product item will have their own background image. And also, on the banner page, we're going to have the, uh, the content. The content will, will include the text, the introduction, the details, the product names, and the product number all of those things. And also we're going to have to include the button that will lead the user to the product detailed page and also the bookmark, which will allow the user to collect this item. So all of those things will be presented over here. Okay, it's going to be a big project. And it needs the backend data because the data kind of from the backend URL, the API, not from the static one that we hard code into our browser. Okay, so the first thing to do is to fetch data from the backend. We're going to do that first. And so think about where is the best place to fetch our data? Do we fetch our data from the home? So we write our data fetching code in our home component or in our hero component. The ideal place is supposed to be at the super, super global parents component, which is the app.js. Because the data, once you fetch it, it's going to be shared across the entire application in the header, in the home, in the hero, and any other places like the shopping bag, the collection bag, all supposed to have access to the data. So if you only fetch the data in the child component, Later on, when you want to use the data again, you have to do another fetching, which is repeating. So now let's fetch the data in the app component. First, we're going to create our API JSON file inside the API folder. I have pre this one for you, so I'm just going to copy and paste the JSON file that I prepared and paste in. And then let me explain how it works. So in this JSON file, it's going to be holding all of our product items, and each item will have an ID, the background image, the title, subtitle, and all other different properties. And on the banner page, we're only supposed to see one of the product item at a time, not all of them. So the way to do so is to use this active property. The one that has been set to true will be present to the user. The one that has been set to false will be hidden. And later on, we're going to show you how you can um, uh, swap them around. 
you can change the active status for each one. Uh, when you click on the next one, this one will be turned on to true. And when you click on the third one, the third one will be turned on to true. So this one can be changed. But, but when the user firstly opened up the browser, they're only supposed to see the first item in the item JSON. Okay, so this is our JSON file. And now we're going to serve this JSON file using the JSON server that I introduced you at the beginning of the video. And hopefully we can see this one on our backend URL. So open up your terminal, control backtick, open up the terminal. Currently we are on the one that holds the browser. We need to open up a new one. So click on the plus sign, open up a new one. And then inside here, if you haven't installed a JSON server, I do recommend you to do so. If you are using Mac, you can type in uh, sudo npm install json server dash g. So this allow you to install a JSON server globally on your computer, but you need to put in your password. So that's why you need to key in the sudo before. If you're using Mac, you just type that npm install JSON server. It'll install that thing straight away for you. And once you've done that, because already installed, so I wouldn't install it again. Once you've done that, you can uh, use that JSON server to watch this JSON file on your backend URL as a mock API. Okay, it will be no different from the real API in the real world. Let's just let's just do that. So here I say JSON server double hyphen watch double hyphen port. I give a port name here. I use four thousand. And you have to tell the computer which folder you want to watch that JSON file. And that JSON file has been stored in our API folder. So we say period slash API slash type in that file's name, items data dot JSON. So once you've done that, you just hit enter. And this one will start to watch it for you. So that's the resources. You're going to click on this one, hold your control key, your command key, and click on this one. It opened up the JSON on the 4000, as you can see now. Okay, this is the uh, our backend URL. It's like the, the real URL has no different, it's except we're using the JSON server to load it. And you can see that uh, the, the data has come in the JSON format with all of those things uh, presenting in a correct way. Okay, so now our next job is going to make the request, a GET request on this API to fetch all of this item data and then present it on our browser. Go back to your editor. Uh, leave this on. If you close it, uh, the, the server will be closed as well. So to leave this on. But you can turn off your terminal. Go back to your app page. We're going to do the calling of that backend. And to fetch the data, we're going to import a few libraries in the app.js. First, we're going to say import React. And then we're going to create a few couple hooks. We're going to create the uh, use state hook here to hold. This is going to be a local state to hold our data. Uh, use state. And we're going to use that use effect hook. So currently, we're going to using these two hooks, uh, which are the built-in hook provided by React straight away. And then down here, we're going to create a local variable, state variable, const items and set items. So this is going to be used to hold our item data once it has been fetched from the backend API. And then use state. Initially, the state of our local item is going to be the empty array. Once we've done the data fetching, this empty array will be reset to that backend URL, which is this one. Okay. And the next job is to do the data fetching. So we have to write a function to fetch our data. And the function can be like an arrow function. Fetch data equals to an arrow function. So here we use that built-in fetching method provided by JavaScript called fetch. We have to tell the computer which URL we want to fetch data. And we have shown you that URL we want to fetch data is localhost 4000 slash items. So we just copy that URL and paste it in. So once we've done that, we're just going to chain the next method in. Then we will have a response from the URL. And we can turn that response to JSON, convert it to JavaScript. And in the next step, once it's converted to JavaScript, we can actually use that data. So that data can be set it into our local variable. So we set item. This is how the uh, use state hook works in React. We first we create a local variable, define the initial status, and then once it's changed, we use the set set local variable and to reset the status of that data. So we set that one to the data that we fetched from the backend. So now we have it. So that's done. And just as a safety, we have to write a catch method because if there's any errors during the data fetching process, we have to know what error is. Uh, supposedly, this one should be shown on the browser somewhere. But uh, because we are doing a, a sample project, we're just going to console.log that for now.
console.log e means error message. Okay, so we show that message on the console if there's any error pops out. So that's the entire way of writing the fetch data from our real uh, the mock API, and then you uh, reset the local variable to the data that we fetched. But you will see that this one looks a bit of a faint. That's because we never have a chance to call this function. We just wrote it. So the way to call this function is to use the use effect hook. The use effect hook is when your app components get firstly mounted on your browser, this function will be called. So whenever your component gets mounted on the browser, the use effect hook will be called. And whatever inside that function will be called as well. So inside it, it's going to be an error function, curly braces, with an empty array. Explain the structure. The error function tells the computer what you want to do when the component first gets mounted on the browser. The empty array is empty, but inside here, you can inject any variables that this function is working depend on. Say, for example, this one is depending on some status of local variables, and you can put that local variable name inside the empty array. So whenever that variable changes, this function will be called again. However, we do want the data to be called only once, and that is the time it first mounted on the browser. So we leave it empty, basically means that it depends on nothing. It depends on nothing basically means it will not be called again. We only want to fetch the data one time. All right. So inside the error function, what we want to do is to do the data fetching. So we say fetch data inside the error function. And when the app component get mounted, the data will be called. Okay, the data will be fetched, this function. And that's how it works. Once it's called, our local state variable item will be updated to the URL JSON array. This is the entire process. OK, we have this part job done. The next part is, now we have the data and stored in our local variable. And that local variable only belongs to the app component. How do we share it across? How do we let the home component use that local variable items and also pass it in to the hero section? Because eventually, the hero section will use that data. right? And the traditional way is to do something called a property drilling. And that's going to set a, say for example, items equals to items. So this local variable, once it's set to data, will be passed as a property value to the home. And then the home will pass this one to the hero. So in the hero, you need to do a property drilling again, items equals to items. But this is going to be very tedious because think about if there's any child component inside the hero that is going to use the item, item variable, you have to drill the property again. And there's too much property drilling. The more child component you have, the deeper you will drill, which is not, not very ideal. So the ideal way to share the, the local variable globally is to use something called use context hook, which is also provided by React. So the way to use that is we need to firstly create a global context and export it. So here we say in app for, in the app.js, we create a global context variable called app context, and that one will be equal to React. Oops, React dot create context. So this will create a context environment and store that environment inside this app dot context app context variable. Okay, and the next step is to use that one to store our um, local variables that you want to share globally. And the way to do so is down here. We use the angle brackets app context dot provider. Close that. This is going to be an opening and a closing angle brackets with that specific name. And whatever you put inside this opening closing angle brackets can share the global variable. So this one, we move that up, hold your Alt key or Option key, um, and then press the up arrow, so move it up. So now, whatever you want to share inside this uh, global environment, and you have to put the child component in. And now you can define the kind of things you want to share. We want to share some values, okay? The value will be, we currently only have two. One is the items, the other one is the set item, the method. So we say items, and then, oops, it comes as a JavaScript object, so you have to put it into the curly braces, items, and then set items. So, so that's the two things we want to share across the entire application. Now the header can access this, this global variable items. The home part can also access these global variables. Beautiful. The next job, is to uh, access or consume that global variable inside our child component. Header, so far we haven't, we have the, developed the header, but our current focus is on the home page and the hero section. So we're going to the home. As you can see, the home is holding that hero, nothing to do with that. And then we go to the hero. The hero is the part that we actually want to access the global variable because we're going to map all of those items on our hero sections. Okay. So now let me just show you how to do that. 
we have to use something called use effect hook, uh, sorry, use context hook. So here we type in use context. And down here, we're going to have to import which global environment you want to use. And that thing is called app context. Remember in the app.js file, we create that app context and export it. You must export it for you to import it over here. Ideally, if you have many global variables, you can export this thing on a separate file. But since it's just one line of code, so I just being lazy and write it over here. Okay, but you can put it on a separate separate document somewhere. And you can import it over here. Okay, so once you import it, you can consume it uh, inside your component. Let's just say doing an object destructuring because all the global variables comes in a JavaScript object. And the thing we want to consume now is the items and the set items, which is the method to control it. And then that one's going to be equal to called use contact hook. And you have to tell the computer which context you want to call. And that's going to be the app context. Save it. So now you can access that global variable items. The global item, the global variable items is what we created in the app.js folder through the data fetching, right? All the logic must be linked up for you to follow through. Now we have the data. And the next thing we want to do is just uh, developing our hero section to map those data into the correct format. Okay, it's pretty much like the typical HTML and CSS job. And to do so, let's firstly delete this uh, hard coding words, give the brackets, and inside here we create something called a banner. That's going to be a div. And inside that banner, what we want to do is uh, creating something called item. Because here we only want to show that one individual item at a time to the user, not all of them. So eventually, this big item will be holding each individual product's details. And those details might including their name, their title, subtitle, uh, their descriptions, or their item number, that kind of things, right? So we're going to be using our template, item template, to hold all of those details. And the first thing inside the item to show is the background image. So we'll create a tag called background image, give it a class name called BG image and tab. The source, well, so far we just leave it empty. Later on, we're going to map it using that uh, dynamic data from the items. And that's the first one. The second one we're going to create is our content. So we do div.content. And inside the content, we probably want to create a bit of a paragraph uh, to show some small descriptions. And that's something as a lorem, give it 10 words, should be sufficient. And that's that. And below that paragraph, uh, we're going to create something like the H1 to hold our title. And the title so far is also going to be a lorem. Uh, maybe we give the five words, not too much. Otherwise, it will take too much space on the screen and squeeze out the remaining component. And then down below that, we need to have the button. That button will be used to allow the user to go to the product detail page. So which is going to be the anchor tag. So give the a button name called the main, main button. Hopefully this button, once you create it, it can be reused. If you want to uh, wrap it up and put it into a separate component, that's absolutely OK. But uh, the more that I wrap that up, the, the more likely you will get confused because um, you try, I'm trying to uh, um, give you more convenience to link your logic. Once I wrap it up, you wouldn't be able to see it on the same page. Yeah, you have to uh, flip around in different filters to link up your logic, which is not ideal for study. So for, so for demonstration purpose, I wouldn't make my code super, super clean. Otherwise, you will lose uh, in the starting process. But when you develop your own project, I do recommend you to uh, wrap those buttons in a separate component and then import it over here. And that'll make your code super clean. OK? So this one we create it and then give the words called a shop now. So now we have that words, <coughs> shop now. Oops, just that. And then below that, we're going to have another button, which is the bookmark. So we create another anchor tag. And then give the class name called, um, let's just say, mark button. All right. So here, this one, we'll just give a, a hash so far. We're going to use some uh, icons. The icons coming from the bootstrap icon again. And then we're going back to it. Let's say that we want some mark. And we want to have the, the one with the plus sign, because we want to indicate to user this is allowing you to add something in. So we have this one. And we copy that, paste it in, give it a name. And same for the shop now, we probably want to add an icon as well. So indicating the user that this one will take you to that shopping area. So we say cart. And I do like the second one, simple and decent. And put it in over here. 
and give it a name, class name. So now we have the two buttons. Ideally, if we're going back to the browser, those things should, should show. Yeah, it does. And we have the shop now and two buttons and also that text was we just put in. All good. Okay. So, so far we have built a simple template for our content. Keep building below that content. So we're going to have a section called a subtitle to hold some other small information. So we say subtitle, give it class name. And inside of here, we're going to have a span and span have a class name of slogan. And, and that is going to say the spring. And by the way, you can make the slogan dynamic as well. You just need to uh, uh, redefine your JSON file, give us a slogan for a different item. So this one is absolutely manip manipulated by yourself. So I'm just using uh, a standard one. So everyone knows that the information can be shown dynamically, but how dynamic you want is up to you. Okay, so this one is spring and uh, summer collections. So if you have the winter or the, uh, the autumn collections, you can use those things absolutely okay. And the next one is going to be a span of number. So this number is going to hold uh, the item number because remember, when you look at a JSON file, each item has its own ID and that thing is going to be the item number. So, so far we just type in 0, 1 to make sure that we have the complete template. And then later on, when we do the data mapping, we're going to change all the hard coding information. So now we have the structure done. As you can see, this is the entire item that I just wrote. And inside here, we have the background image, we have the content, and we have the subtitle. And all the things have been uh, piled up together as a whole thing. So when we do the mapping, each data comes in as a set from the JSON will be mapped into this kind of item template. All right. And we will have eight of them because if you look at the URL of the backend, we have eight items and these eight items will all be mapped into something like this item. And but the information inside will be dynamic and change it accordingly. All right. So now if we go back to the browser to see, uh, we do have those things done and uh, it looks pretty ugly because we haven't put in uh, any of those uh, um, CSS in, but uh, the next job is going to do the data mapping. Um, instead of hard coding, what I'm going to do is to cut. Actually, I leave this one on for now. I write above it. I show you how to do these things properly. Above it, we write a JavaScript. Whenever you want to weave JavaScript inside the HTML in, in the React.js project, you need to use the double curly braces to wrap it. This will tell the computer that I'm now writing a JavaScript inside the HTML. And the beauty of the React is to allow you to uh, put those two things together. You don't have to write a separate files for your JS. You can write straight away inside the HTML, which is really, really nice and easy. So here we write items. First, we're going to check, do we have the items variable ready? So if that thing is true, see, double ampersand, and we can ask computer if the items dot length is greater than zero. Greater than zero basically means that you want to double confirm this items is not an empty array. It does have that data in it. Otherwise, it wouldn't do the math mapping properly. If those things are true, we're going to do another ampersand, double ampersand, and then the next job is to do the mapping. So we say items map. Inside here, we're going to put in that arrow function. So we say item, we're going to map each object inside that items array into our template. The template that we created is this item that we just wrote and built. So we cut the entire thing and put it in here. And it will say there's no error. When you save it, you should have the prettier installed on your code editor. It will do the automatic formatting for you. And it will see that everything looks all correct, no errors in your code. All right. So, so far, what we have just did is just done the mapping and think about how many items that we have inside the array. We have eight items. And hopefully, when you look at a browser, we should have eight of this item being repeated on the browser. And let's look at that. All correct. Okay. So, this thing has been repeated for eight times, which is what we're looking for because we do have eight objects inside that array. So, and by the way, this dot map thing is called JavaScript higher order array function. And it's a, a super cool function that replaced the, the traditional way of writing the, the loop. Otherwise, you have to write a loop, the loops through your array, and then um, enable each one to be um, transformed into this kind of a HTML template, which is very, very consuming. But uh, this one will make the things a lot easier. But job is not done yet because whenever we use the mapping, we do need to uh, put a key for each item to make sure that each item is unique identified. 
So here we say items dot underscore ID. So give them an ID assigned to each item and that'll make them different. And we know that the ID is that uh, is different from our JSON file 1234585678. So those are all different. There's no problem. And the source, the source should be coming from our JSON as well. If you look at a JSON, uh, we have uh, this API, we have the back BG image that holds the directory of our image, but I haven't put that image into our folder yet. So what I will do, I'll open the public folder and copy and paste in our image folder. So in the public, oops, that's incorrect. Undo, yes, undo. Let's copy and paste. Yeah, that looks like I I copied the wrong direction again. So just give me one second. Yeah, that one's in. So I have the asset folder. Inside it, I inside the asset folder, I have the items folder which hold all of our background images, these fashion images. And by the way, due to the copyright issue, I just randomly select this fashion image from um, the pixel.com and because it's copyright free. If you do have your fashion image or your any other images that you want to use to customize your website, it's entirely up to you, okay? So do not pay too much attention to the images that I used. Uh, the focus of the course is to um, show you how to do this uh, e-commerce project using React.js, right? But uh, these images are not that bad, at least they look decent. I can show the theme of our project already. So it's inside assets folder, which is mapping the directory dot dot slash assets items fashion name, okay, the fashion image name. And then once you have that done, going back to your image, we can access that property. And we're saying that image item dot bgimg, save it. And we know that bgimg is one of the properties so we can access the directory. And that directory will allow the computer to find the actual image inside the static folder. And when you go back to the browser, you will see all of those images have been correctly loaded up. You should have eight of them. That's no problem, okay? So the mapping is working. Our next job is to do the remaining dynamic settings. So for example, you can um, rewrite this one. Maybe you want to write it, say um, this one is going to be the item dot title because let's look at the URL. We do have that item title there and that's going to be our subtitle. So we're going to use that one as well. <coughs> so maybe you change that paragraph to uh, item dot subtitle. Save it. So now you can see that this information can all be dynamic uh, based on whatever you put in into your data file. So later on, when you want to update your website or you want to change the catalog of your fashion item, all what you need to do is to change your JSON file. And the real project, all what you need to do is to change the details and data in your database. All right. And so far we store this, this data in our JSON file and the real project, this information is supposed to be stored in your online database or cloud driver. And once you update your database, your web browser, your web page will change accordingly. You will never have a chance to touch the foundational structure of your code. And that is the correct way to do things. Okay. And think about what else we need to change. This one that I want to focus on. The number should be dynamic, which is the, the best place to, to show you if we can do the dynamic setting. And this one's supposed to be item dot underscore ID because we leave the zero on to make it look beautiful. And then I could I couldn't think of anything else that we can make it dynamic. Pretty much everything becomes dynamic. All right. So now if you're going back and you will see that uh, this looks pretty, pretty ugly, but all the data mappings is correct. Everything that we need is there. And can, you can see the number one is there. And after we scroll the second picture, you will see the number two is there. That basically means that all the things have been set correctly. Okay. What about the next one? The next job is to do the CSS part. I'm just going to be quickly copy and paste the CSS for this part and to make it look much nicer and explain it for you. For the entire banner, we wanted to take the full width of the screen and also the whole height of the screen. We want to hide anything that's overflowing. This part will allow you to, um, to, to see a transparent dark shadow on top of the image. It's like a cover shadow because when you look at an image, that thing is pretty bright. You wouldn't give the user enough color contrast. And you can see that the white text words looks pretty, pretty blurry um, with that image as a background. So we want to put a dark background image. However, the image if we adjust it using Photoshop or whatever software you use is going to be very time consuming. So instead of changing the image, we put a dark background shadow on top of the image, which gives sufficient color contrast to make sure the text stand out. 
okay so that's what it is for so make sure it take the full screen make sure the transparency you set to 0 0.4 well however you can adjust this uh, transparency based on you what you want you can make it even darker you can make it even lighter all right so that's that and the next one is going to set our items uh, with the items we do have that the padding setting uh, give a bit of a space on both sides and also uh, make sure it take the whole width and whole screen height uh, justify content space between to make sure they spread out the background image this part um, initially what we want to do is that um, we want to hide our image this is the code o opacity zero and the visibility hidden we want to hide all the images only the images with the active class name will be shown to the user how do we achieve that in CSS in, in the in the JavaScript we use this if you look at that uh, backend URL we do have this active property only the one that has the active true is supposed to be shown to the user and the remaining stuff all supposed to be hidden okay we're going to take this property and render our component class name conditionally to the user and there's a bit more job and to finalize our project so say for example in the banner image the background image instead of hard coding the back the background image what I will do I will write a bit of a JavaScript here using um, the template literal we first put in a static class name there and then we do the conditional rendering we want to check if this item is currently on active status if it's true we're going to give the class name of active if it's not we're going to give a class name of undefined save it why, why do I do that because if it's on active it's supposed to have a new class name active being added to the class name list and once that thing is done this part will be working because with the background image on active class name it's supposed to be shown to the user and expanded in full okay so that's how the code is working and then not only we can apply the logic to here what else the content is supposed to be worked dynamically as well so just copy and paste that one and change the static class name to content to make this part dynamic as well the content will be shown okay and then the next one that I want to make it dynamic is the number so that this one I'm just gonna change this one to a number alright so the number will be shown dynamically all good so once I have those things done if we go back to the browser and it will see beautiful all the things have been presented correctly to the user and only the first one gets to show the second third up to eight all has been hidden up all right so this is the so far what we have built for the uh, banner page or the hero section the next part that we want to do is to make this thing changeable because the user are supposed to be able to click on somewhere to, to swap between one two three four five six seven eight right and that's going to include our swiper here which is the image carousel that'll show the users all the catalogs and allow them to click on and change the background image and also the content okay so this is the position where we're going to incur the swiper of this one so you go to the swiperjs.com and I'll show you how to uh, use their code and remember at the very beginning of the video when we install all the third party dependencies in the package.json we have installed this swiper already uh, if you did not, if you did not install it you better do it right now just a key in open up your terminal a new one just key in npm install swiper it'll install that one for you and you have that code over here as well npm install swiper all right just done that once you've done it I'll show you how to write a code so let's firstly create a, a swiper component uh, inside that component folder so here we create a new file and call it a hero a swiper because the swiper will only be used in our hero section not anywhere else um, but you can name it the thing you want ideally we don't name it the swiper straight away because a swiper is a default component name provided by swiper.js so name it something else hit enter rfc8 create a boilerplate and then very quickly to create another CSS file for it so that is called hero swiper.css so we have that one done so going back to your CSS component uh, the swiper component I import that uh, hero swiper.css so that thing has been linked in so now you have your swiper and going to your hero where do we put the swiper we have that item has been perfectly mapped in this security braces it's a whole JavaScript so we need to write a new swiper things down here below that write a new JavaScript also we need to double check again if the item is ready and if the items length is greater than zero if you do not do this checking it might it might be working you might encounter no errors during the development process but when it comes to the production process you, there will be errors because 
when the data gets fetched from the backend URL, there's going to be delays. It's not instantaneous, right? It's going to take a couple of seconds, maybe, depending on your internet speed. And if there's a delay, the item will initially be an empty array, and the length will be zero. Okay, so if that's a thing, it basically means that you're going to be map nothing. You're going to map an empty array into this kind of uh, template, and that's going to be an error. Okay, so we're going to have to wait until the data is ready for it to be mapped or turned into other format. And then if, if these two conditions are satisfied, what we want to do is that uh, we want to show that a hero swiper. So here we say hero swiper auto importation is working. So now we have that. Uh, let's double check. Yeah, right above, that thing has been correctly imported. And if you look at a swiper so far, we only have the text words in it. Going back to the browser, and uh, nothing's shown there. Let me see if I can change the text font color. Just take that, put it in, and supposedly we should see something. Yep, not yet. Um, let me just keep building, and uh, once we finalize the swiper, it's hopefully it will show there. So, yeah, but that's the right place for you to put in your hero swiper. So inside the swiper, uh, so far we have done a lot of code, but I, we want to use the swiper.js stuff, which is here. So we need to import a whole bunch of things from here. And then this is how you apply that uh, swiper module. You're going to import the swiper CSS. And you're going to import all of this uh, navigation pagination, depending on which one you want to use. The one that I use that has no navigation or pagination, so it's a simple one. But it looks decent and nice. So what I will do, I'll copy and paste the thing that I imported in my project instead of using the default one, so you know how to do it. So I copy and paste in. You're going to have to import a swiper and a swiper slide, and also the CSS. And uh, if you do have, if you do need the patternations, you can import that here. Otherwise, you can just remove it. I don't think I need uh, the patternation for this project. Uh, but we do need an autoplay, because you, you need that uh, carousel effect. Even though the user don't swipe it, you can still um, see the image moves itself. So that's that. So we import all of those things. The next part is to create a, a boilerplate for our swiper. So what I will do is inside a return, I delete all of those things. And I write on uh, the swiper. This swiper component is the actual swiper component provided by swiper.js. That's why I didn't ask you to give your component the same name. It will confuse the computer. And then yeah, close that. That will be working. And we're going to do a whole bunch of settings for the swiper. And all the settings must be injected in the first angle bracket. So here we say, I'm just going to copy and paste in and explain for you. Uh, slide per view, we want that each view have only one slide and give them a bit of space, otherwise they'll be too narrow. Uh, you want to autoplay because you have imported the autoplay module, so you can set the autoplay time, which is the two and a half second. You want to set up the different breakpoint, so the the slide per view will be different on different uh, screen sizes. So for example, when a user look at a computer on a tablet or on a mobile, it's going to be different. All right. So we have these things. We want the things to be looping. Looping means that it's keep, keep moving itself. And we, we make sure that you uh, include the module here as well. You need to import that and consume that for it to work. All right. So this is how you define and preset your swiper. And inside your swiper, what you can do is to do um, your slide. So this is just the big wrapper outside. You need to define how you want to show your slide. But to think about where the slide come from. The slide come from the outside hero page. We have to uh, tell the computer, you're going to show the images, the preview image of that fashion item. So the slide is going to consume our preview image. So going back to our hero, we're going to have to set a property called a slide. And that slide, and hopefully we're going to access our items, because remember, there's only one images so far we have defined in our API, and that's the background image. We're going to use this background image again as a preview image for our slider. Okay, so that one's there. So then we pass that item object, which we fetched from our URL, as an array to our slides, so the slides can access the item's background image and show it in the slider. All right, so that's the logic. And so once you're going back, so to the swiper, so here we're going to say, do a data mapping to the slides. Oops, we have to uh, object destructuring that property slides. 
The reason why I can do so is because we inject it as a property to the child component. Whenever you add a property to the child component, you can consume that property over here by doing the object destructuring. And then down here, you just write your JavaScript code by saying slice dot map. We'll map it into that built-in um, swiper slide. So that's going to be slide map it brackets. So inside brackets, we say swiper slide. And then you close that brackets. Done. Okay. So this thing comes from here because we import that swiper slide from right above. So that's why you can use it. It's not something you build. It's been provided by the swiper.js, which is a third party library. And for each slide, you're going to give a unique key because we're doing that JavaScript higher ordering function again. And then that dot underscore ID. This slide, by the way, is no different from the item. It's the same thing. I just give them a different name for you to look some more properly uh, inside this swiper. And just think about what does this slide contains. The slide is going to contain the images, right? So here I will give them an image tag. And the source of that image is going to be a slide dot bg image. That's it. OK, so that's it. That is how we pass in that background image uh, to our uh, slide slide. And then if you go back, you will see those things there. It's a swipeable. Those eight images are all there. It takes the whole screen. That's why that's because we haven't given any CSS yet. So so far, it's just randomly uh, put them all together. But it's working. This thing is swipeable. And also, it's showing them all together and one by one. Beautiful. The next job for us to do is to enable the CSS for our swiper so it can be placed into the correct position and also looks much nicer. Let's just do that. So what I will do. I'll go to that uh, hero swipers.css and I'm going to copy and paste the thing that I have set up for you. So copy and paste. As you can see that uh, the swiper I make the position absolute, just pretty much down the top right bottom. Uh, sorry, the bottom left, uh, the bottom right. So to make it um, around that uh, um, right bottom corner and uh, make sure that the width is not uh, too wide, 50% uh, of the screen wide and 40% of the screen height and make the background transparent. And also for each slide, I give them a bit of border radius, give them a cursor effect. And for the image, it makes sure that it adjusts the image to take the whole width and height and object the fit. All right. So that's the code. We're not going to be using this one so far. So that's going to be our computer. So once we've done that, we're going back to the browser. You can pretty much see, just refresh it. This swipe is shown here. Okay. That's uh, exactly the way that we want it to be look like. And it's entirely swipeable. If you don't touch it, just leave it on for a while. You will see that this one's looping itself. Uh, the images are all moving. Okay, but uh, if you want to show the, you want to see the remaining quicker, you can swipe yourself. When it's on mobile, you can swipe these things with your finger. That's absolutely working. All right. So the looking of the website is all okay now. The next part is to uh, trigger on the click events, because ideally, when a user click on one of those images, the background image should change, and also that the content should change accordingly as well. But so far, we haven't done that yet. So going back to our code, close off this uh, CSS thing. We have done those. Um, in the hero, let's think about what is the best place to uh, put that uh, on click events to change our slide. Do we change it over here or change it inside our uh, hero swiper? I would say that you put it into that uh, um, the parents component. The principle of, of setting these things is that a child component will read the event, which is the child component in our case is a hero swiper. The hero swiper will raise the events, the click events. However, the parent component will handle the events. The parent component is the hero component. All right? Because eventually all the content and images will be changed inside our parent component, not inside our child component. So I say that the principle again. The child component raise the events, and the parent component will handle that event. Okay? So let's say that um, we we'll write a function. We we'll write a function here. And call it um, const handle slide change, and that's going to be the arrow function. The arrow function will take one parameter, the ID, because we do need to know which images that has been clicked on, not a random one. Okay, so we need to let the function know that uh, just looking at this ID and change that image. So we must pass that ID in, and give them an arrow function. And so far, we're not going to run any detailed code for that. We're just going to console.log that ID and to see if the click event is working. So we put that in, right? But how do we let the child component access that function? This is the time that we use our uh, property drilling. So we give them a second property called a slide change. 
and that's an equal to handle slide change which is the function right above this one all right so now the child the child component have access to that function we're going to that child component and raise that on click events this is the proper way to do it so now over here for each slide or more specifically for each image we want to put it on the image we we'll give them an on click events to raise that to raise that we use a arrow function and we say slide change curly braces um, to use that uh, property because we inject that property here we have to uh, object destructuring to add it in otherwise you can't consume it so we add it in here so we can use it here how do we fetch the id here slide dot underscore id so now we have it so whenever you click on the image the image will find the id and raise that slide change events and then that slide change events will be handled over here in the parents component and so far we just want to show down the console let's say if it's working so i turn on this is the uh, going to the console remove that i click on this one that says four i click on this one says five seven eight so all of those things as you can see has been shown on console the id is linkable uh, the id has been passed in with no problem all right so this one is working and the next job i close the console is to write the actual function to change the slide so over here the logic of changing that uh, slide is to uh, change the active status if you look at the api only the first one has now been set to true so whenever the user click on any of the images that images the active status should be set to true and the remaining one should be set to false so we just want to change the property value for the active right so that's the logic and then the way to do so is that we first we're going to map through all of those components set them all to false and then find the one that we click on using that id that has been passed in and set that one specifically to true all right so very simple logic and let's just say that we create a new items this is going to be a new array and that new array is going to be retrieved from the data mapping equals to items map so we map through each of them the next the first job is to uh, set all of those active status to false so no one is true no one is active and then we found which one has been clicked on so using the if statement by saying that if the item dot underscore id so this is the checking uh, pretty much like looping through each of the elements inside that array to see if any of those id actually triple equals to the id that has been passed in because the id that has been passed in is the one we click on remember i just show you on the console so if that thing is equal this condition satisfied we will set specifically that item active to true so that's how we achieve it right so once you've done that you just return that item so this is how we handle each item uh, inside this items array if it's not satisfying this condition that then the item active status will be set to false otherwise it will be set to true and then we return it so again we're going to make sure only one of the items active status is set to true in the end so once we've done that we assign that newly changed status of the array assign it to a new a variable and then we're going to reset our item so here down the bottom we just say set items set items to our new items which is the one that we have to set okay so once we've done that the thing should be working uh, in the browser let's just see if it's working just reload it for now and the first one the second one see once i click on the second one all the things change the background image changes accordingly and that number two changes this has this pop on and pop down effects really really cool right this is five six seven okay all good eight one two four three so everything is popping up and down so it looks pretty cool and it changes accordingly and so the tricks behind it under the hood is really really simple it's just uh, changing the active status of each and make sure you have the css to work accordingly and that'll, that'll do yeah it's not like a super complicated job and uh, it's actually a very simple step and with the help of react these things is much easier to achieve if you're using vanilla javascript it's probably going to cost you half page code to write the things but with react you are allowed to use those mapping functions and you can weave those javascript directly into your HTMLs. and the things will become a lot easier all right so now we have pretty much done the jobs for our, our banner sections for our banner sections the next part what i'm going to do is to show you how can we allow the user 
Say, for example, they choose the second item, the second one. And when they click on the shopping now, it takes the user to the product detail page and allow the user to, to choose the, the product size and see the price and all, all that kind of stuff. Right? And then we, we will, I'll show you how the user can add this product into the shopping bag. But so far, the numbers in the shopping bag and the collection bag are, we, are, are hard coded by us. So, but supposedly, this, this number are, are dynamic or make it dynamic very quickly. All right, so to do that, the next job is to think, is the product detailed page are going to be on the same page? No, absolutely not. So it's going to be on a separate page, which is a new page. And we are building a multiple page website. So the next thing to do is to create another page and allow the user to change or swap between different pages to see the different information. That's the position or the situation where we use another library that we have pre-installed at the very beginning of this video and going to the package.json file show you, which is the reactor router DOM. We have installed this one, where we haven't had a chance to use them, but we're going to use it now. To do so, I need you to open up your index.js file. This is probably the only situation for this project for you to touch on this. And you know, once you changed it, you can just leave it as what it is. And inside here, I want you to import that reactor router DOM over here by saying import the browser router from reactor router DOM, that's all. Okay, so just import that. And then down here, I want you to wrap that app component with the browser router. Browser router, open and closing tag, you must move that app inside the browser router, okay, to make, to make things work. Okay, so that's it, that's all. So the first step is this one, very important. A lot of the new uh, users of uh, React um, get started from the app.js file straight away. I forgot to do this setting and eventually the, the reactor router DOM wouldn't work and they just go confused. And uh, just bear in mind, you need to do this setting first. Once it's done, close that off, open up your app.js file. And we're going to do a few more settings. First, we're going to import all the components or modules we're going to use from reactor router DOM. So I'm just going to copy and paste the thing that I wrote. We're going to import the routes and the route from reactor router DOM so just like the uh, import convention, pay attention to how I did. And the external vendor will be imported right above. The customized one will be right below. So that's like in the convention. Later on, you don't confuse yourself, right? So now we have the access to the routes and a route. So we're going to use it down below. Down here, we'll say that a header, let's say which page the header should be on. The header is on every single page, OK? This is not a discussable problem. Because whichever page you go, you want to see the header with the navigation and all the icons on. Okay, but a home page is one page, and now we are building our second page. Our second page, we can build that page component in this folder, and we call it item details.jsx. Enter RFCE, create a boilerplate, and then very quickly, we're just going to say item details.css. Oops, typo. Yeah, this has a plural. Have to be the same. Just a very good convention that you uh, um, manage to uh, remove all the typos inside your project. But I know, but I know that even though after many years, there's still going to be this kind of issue. And details. CSS, right? So inside your item details, this is going to be a separate page. We we'll import our CSS file, so these two are linked up together. <clears throat> Maybe you want to close off the home page for now, and also the hero, the swiper. And now you have that, and I caught, put it into the H1, so you, later on you can see this. This is a separate page, the item details. How do we show them separately on different page using that reactor router DOM? We have this routes, so we're going to use it inside our global variable. Just be very careful. You must have the bigger wrapper, which is your app context global variable wrapper at the outside, and inside it, you're going to do your routes wrapper. So we say routes, plural, close it. And once you've done that, this is going to hold all of your routes, and you're going to define each individual route inside it. Okay. So the first route that we want to define and is that home page. So we say exact path equals to slash. So that means the root directory element. So inside the elements, we're going to tell the computer which component to show. 
So if it comes in the in the curly brace, inside that we're gonna show the home page, right? So cut, paste. This is how it works. But think about where you wanna put the header. Will the header be placed inside the route? No, the header is not going to be inside the route because the header is going to show on every single page. So the header is outside the route, but inside the global environment. Okay, so that's how you do it. So now you have your thing, the root directory exact has to be that directory for the browser to deliver the home component. And then if you're going back to the browser, we are now on the, on the root directory, I just refresh, it's the same. Okay, nothing changes. And then we're gonna define our second page which is our uh, the item detail page. The item detail page will have that uh, specific item ID linked to it because we need to know which item detail to show. It's not showing the, all the items, it's only showing one individual item, right? So here we say root exact path. So how do we know which item we're actually trying to present um, their details? We have to use something called a route parameter and the way to do a route parameter inside uh, React is to do something like this. Colon ID. When you put a colon ID, the computer will know that you're actually using the route parameter. This ID is dynamic. Anything you put in will be passed as a parameter. But if you do not include that colon, this ID will be a, a static name. It's a part of the route. Okay? So just be very careful how you do the route parameter. And, uh, oops. Just gonna close that. It's a self closing angle bracket and elements. Elements equals to curly braces. We're just going to include the one that we just created, which is the item detail, and close it. Just check right above the item detail has been imported correctly. Yeah. So now the item detail page can have access to your routes parameter. Let's just give it a try. Going back to your item detail page, let's see if I access the the individual items number. To access that route parameter, we have to use some hook from the React router DOM. So here we say import uh, use params from React router DOM. Make sure that's in, it's imported from React router DOM. And down below, we're going to access that uh, route parameter. So over here we say const id. It's object destructuring. We destructure that parameter and fetch the ID of it because we name it ID over here. Okay, so that's how you access the Rust parameter. So here we say item details hyphen. Let's say ID. If we can fetch the Rust parameter successfully, basically means that this ID should be shown here on our item detailed page. So whenever the user click on on that image, it should lead the user to the correct page showing the correct item ID. But we haven't um, created the link yet. And think about when the user click on the shopping now, it should go to the item detailed page, right? With a specific item ID. And we have to put that page link into our shopping now button. So going back to our hero and find the uh, shop now, this one. Here we want to put in the link. But the problem is with the uh, traditional anchor tag and with the um, href, if you put the link directly here, say for example, you put in that uh, uh, item details, that has no problem. It'll go to that page. But this one will give you some flinking effect. It's probably going to reload your page, which is not ideal. The ideal way is to use some built-in component, the link component from React Router DOM to make this thing work even nicer. I'll show you. So inside Hero, what we're going to do over here, we're going to import a link from React Router DOM. This is a link component which replaced the anchor tag, but it has the same function. On the browser, it will transform that link component to anchor tag anyway, but it will remove that flinking and reloading effect of the typical anchor tag. So here we just say this one is going to be a link. This one as well, just open and closing brackets to link. Instead of using href, it used to. It tells the computer to which page, it to item detailed page. And then the most important thing is that we must pass in that route parameter. And the way to do so, I'm just gonna remove this one, rewrite it. We use JavaScript 
to pass in the routes parameter here. So this one gonna be a, a temporary literal, and inside here slash items and slash money sign double curly braces. We pass in that items dot underscore ID. So now you have the item ID passed in as a parameter inside this route. And remember this route, going back to the app page, slash items slash ID will lead us to that specific individual product detailed page. All right. So you see a slash. Okay, that'll do. So now if we're going back to our page, so for example, this is the number three. Let me try if it's working. I click on three. As you can see, it goes to that items slash three. And that three has been passed in as a route parameter shown on the browser. As long as we can fetch that item ID, we can fetch the detailed information of that item using the fetch function. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is a kind of the trick that we uh, fetch the detailed information. When you do the real project, uh, you probably want to do two fetchings. The first fetching of the data is on your home page. This one. It's on your home page. You do a data fetching of all the, of the products. The second fetch, you probably want to make a GET request to your backend URL, but only fetching the detailed information of a specific item. So that's two different data fetching, right? So this one will allow you to achieve so. And uh, click on that one, it's number seven. The number seven gets passed in at the rest parameter and showing on the browser. We have no problem. So this is all linked up, all linked up. And the next job is to build up our item detailed page with that item detailed information. So the next job is to fetch data again uh, we know that we have fetched data already inside our app.js, but this is like a fetched array data. We will have the whole page of the, uh, the JSON array. But now we are not needing this whole array. We only need one of them, uh, depending on which ID we have been passed. So we're going to do a, a mock fetching again inside this page, just try, trying to find the detailed information for that specific item. So in a real project, uh, you should have the capacity to build an endpoint to fetch that each individual item with uh, the single information instead of showing all of them. But we are building a mock API, so it's not as perfect as the real one. So what I will do is going to do some modification to our data fetching. I'll copy and paste that uh, code for you to for you to see what's going on there. Again, uh, first let me set up a few hooks that we're going to use inside this project. One is called use state. The other one is uh, use effect. And then we're probably going to use, use contact hook as well later on. So I'm going to include all of these. And then the next one, I'm going to um, build a local state variable. This one is purely local, belong to that item detail. <coughs> so this item, single item, set item, not plural. So that one is going to be a use state hook. And inside the parentheses, we we want to initialize it as an empty object, not empty array. That's a key different from this one and the previous one. The previous one is fetching the whole array, but this one is only fetching one object. All right. So down here, we're going to write a function to fetch that individual item. <clears throat> but we know that uh, we have this only one kind of the API endpoint. When you fetch it, you're going to fetch the whole array anyway. So I do a bit of modification in the function to achieve this purpose. So I'll say that uh, const fetch data equals to parentheses that fetch parentheses. And then it's going to be the same same routes. So just copy that in. We copy, we fetch from the same routes. And then it's going to be response response.json. And then data, and then data. Here we're going to set our local individual item to the data that we fetched, but we only need the one that that we actually want to uh, show on a detailed page, not the whole array. So a little trick here is that we set item to data. Instead, we want the data index. All right, so we want to know which one that we have been passed in. Ideally, it's going to be the ID. So we want the data ID to be passed in. And the ID, we, we can get it from the rest parameter over here. Maybe let me just move this one to the right top. Yeah, we, we fetched ID from the rest parameter. We have the whole array of the data, but we only on the ID. Okay, so the problem is when it comes to array, 
the index of that object starts from zero, but ID starts from one. So even though we have the ID one uh, being called, you're probably going to end up fetching this one, the second item, because the index in the array starts from zero. So we have to do a bit of a changing here. So what I will do, I will write a new expression. I create that index variable. We first we pass integer. We pass that ID. Maybe the ID comes at a, a string. Uh, the the variable type is a string. We pass that to integer, and we manually minus one to get the index of it. Once we have the index of it, we can use that index to fetch that specific item that we want. All right. So this is how we do it. I think this is the uh, most close way to fetch the information of that individual item. And then the last but not least, once we've done that, on the next line, just write that a catch function. If we catch any errors, we're going to console.log the error. In a real project, you don't have to worry about this. You can just set that to the whatever thing you fetch from the endpoint straight away because the endpoint will eventually deliver you a one single object item in a JSON, okay, instead of an array. We are building a mock API, so we have this tiny problem, and I fixed that using this way. I build a uh, an index to fetch that individual item. So that's what it is. And then once we have that, we're just gonna using that use effect hook like how we did in the uh, app.js. We're gonna use it again here. So. Once this uh, item detail gets mounted on the browser, this thing will be fetched. This uh, use effect hook will be called. The fetch data function will be called, and our local variable uh, item will be set to that. So that's how we fetched it. All right. So we have that thing done. So now, instead of showing that uh, ID, what I want to show is um, let's try if we can actually get item dot uh, which property I want to use. Uh, Let's see if we can actually get item dot um, background image. The background image is different for each one, so that's the best way to show uh, BJ image. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, you have that. See, we have that uh, SS slash fashion seven. If we're going back to our root localhost three thousand, and we choose the second one, shop now. I have that fashion second image. That's no problem, all right? This thing has been working perfectly fine. We can get the detailed information for each. Done. And the next part is going to set up our template because after all, we will have a, some kind of a UI to show that detailed product information instead of just listing like that. So inside here, we're going to create a div. So in here, we delete this uh, random thing and we start to create it from scratch. We still need a div, but I give a class name, and we call it item details. Later on, we're going to put a CSS uh, for this class name, and uh, we need a new content tab. And inside this content, we create a something called uh, the Bootstrap thing. We use that uh, container fluid tab. So now we have that uh, structure set up. And then inside this container, I create a few rows. And the first one we're going to create, uh, let's create a row and give a bit of a, a padding. P-5 is like a padding. It's a bootstrap built-in stuff. So instead of uh, uh, defining the paddings in the CSS, you can use this easy way to do so. And that's all going to be the big row. Inside this big row, um, what we're going to do is going to create a column column on larger screen. It takes two, two column. The bootstrap works in a way that comes with a 12 column. And you have to let the computer know that uh, how many column you are going to take. So, but uh, eventually, all the column add up together must equal to 12, because that's the total number of column the bootstrap can offer. Okay, so inside that we do this. And that two column will be holding our preview images uh, for our staff. So what I will do I'll copy and paste in all of the preview stuff, like so. All right, so that's the first uh, inside the row. It contains 12 columns, and uh, the first two columns will be holding our preview images. I didn't put in that uh, preview image, something like that, there. It's up to you. Offer this template to you. You can use your own preview image for each item. Um, otherwise, for demonstration purposes, it's going to be very, very time consuming, and uh, eventually, it's just the image you want to choose. 
And also, for this image, you can make them dynamic. You could just uh, set the preview image one, preview image two, or set up another uh, object inside a JSON array. So you can um, allow the user to access the preview image dynamically based on the item they chose. Okay, so that's up to you. I just leave the template here. We need a full preview image to uh, fill up the space. So once that's done, there's two columns. Starting from this line, we'll be giving a column of five on a large screen. So we have a five column. Um, here we're going to access that uh, image, which is our main image. So in the source, we're just going to type in item.bj image and uh, class name um, image fluid and give it a uh, customized name. Later on, we're going to do some CSS to it, item image. So the, the image fluid is uh, the bootstrap scene. This will allow the image to take the whole space, like the 100% width and height, that kind of things. Yep. So we've done that. And uh, let's see how many columns we have so far. There's a two column. There's a five column. We have a remaining five columns, which will be given to the rest of the staff. So we'll say the div uh, column large five. So that's the remaining five. So they add up together 12 plus five plus five. It, um, two plus five plus five equals to 12. That's all good. So in here, we say we want h2, which will be used to hold item title. So here going to be item.title. And by the way, we have fetched that individual item objects from our API. So this one will be um, the title here. Okay, so we are fetching the individual items property from this object. And down here, we create a new class called item price to demonstrate the price of that item. And h4 dot price. Price. We give them a money sign and we use some um, JavaScript objects to make sure it looks nicer. We say price dot item dot price. This actually can show the price, but uh, sometimes we want to uh, present a user with the, the currency format, like we have the uh, the money signs on one thing, and also we want to have this comma uh, for every three digit. If you want to have that, you can use something like uh, item dot price dot two location string. That thing, and we want to make sure that uh, you give them the string of English US. So if you have that. Uh, this will give you that comma after every three digits. It looks nicer for currency. So this is the one. And probably the next one, I want to show you some details of that product. And this one will be a paragraph inside. We put in that uh, item dot description. All right. So this one is going to be item dot description. Over here, we we'll access that property, and we've done that. <clears throat> done that. Let's see what else we want to we want to make sure we have. We're gonna add some item size, large, extra large, small size, that kind of things. And also, we want to uh, enable the user to choose the quantity they want to buy: one, two, three, four. The minimum is one. The maximum is ninety-nine. Just in case some random user is putting one thousand, uh, four thousand, some. An unreasonable number there, so we have to uh, restrict the quantity they can choose. Uh, the range is, is between one to ninety nine. All right, so those are the two remaining things. And also, if you look at this, this uh, information page, we also have that discount. Um, we should probably present this discount on our product page as well because this is going to be some attractive information, right? So below the price, after this H four tag, what I will do, I will set up some structures to conditionally rendering that discount information because not every item is on discount. Only the one on discount will have a special format, right? So what I will do, give them credit brief, to write some JavaScript by saying item.discount if that item.discount not equal to zero, we want to show something, okay? Oops. Not curly brace. Double ampersand. We want to show something. We want to show the discount information. Okay. 
So I now I'm just gonna copy and paste in the discount information, that one there. So if it's not equal to zero, we want to show that uh, discount information for the user. I explain for you. I show that how many percentage is off. So what's the counter price is, okay? So that's the kind of information you can present. And below that, we want to set up the, the size for user to choose. And also we want to set up the quantity for user to choose, okay? So just right below this description paragraph, we say H4 um, size. So we have that done. And think about it, the size is interesting. All clothes come with a standard size, but uh, this information is not included in our um, JSON file. I didn't put it in. Um, you can put the size of, of that product in here, uh, like a, a JSON array inside as a property, but I, I haven't done so. So what I will do, I'll create the product size um, in this file to offer that kind of information, okay? So going back to the top, um, below that, we create a new array called the size list. I copy and paste in. Each size has an ID, has a uh, the size name, a small, extra, middle, that kind of things, and also the the active status. Only the middle one is, has been set to true. Other things are false. You're gonna have to pick a size, right? Otherwise, you can't sell the clothes without a size. And once we've done that, we create a local state variable. We create a local state variable to hold that size data and put it into that size, all right? Now we have that size. And the next thing is that um, when the user click on the size, we should allow the user to um, change the active status of each, all right? Change the active status of each. The logic of it is the same as how we handle the navigation and how we handle the active image, background image. So I'm just gonna copy and paste in the function. It's pretty simple. Depending on which ID you have chose, we first will map through all the sizes, make sure they've all been set to false, and only the one that has been clicked on that ID, we found it, we set it to true, and then we return that, and we set the size to the new size, okay? So that's the logic of it. This line of code is currently not using, so I'm just, I'm just gonna comment that out. So we have done that. So once you've done that, below sizes, you can put in that, uh, that function, to map through all the sizes that we have uh, defined above in the local variable. So I just put it in. So this create a class name called size. We map through the local state variable size and uh, we make sure that uh, it has been a unique ID assigned to, assigned to it. We make sure that when it's on active, we have a different uh, class name. So in a CSS, we can redefine that special class name active. And we make sure that uh, the handle size click function got triggered here, all right? So now you should have it. If you're going back to the browser, it's there. You can see it's there. It's just not formatted yet, but it's there. All the information is there, okay? And uh, this looks uh, nicer. It looks standard. Later on, when I add on the CSS, it will look much better, okay? So that's the size. <clears throat> so here inside this uh, item detail CSS, I'm just gonna copy and paste in all the CSS file. So make sure it's position relative and take the full screen and also uh, has the minimum height of 100%. Uh, that's gonna be the color for um, the, the text inside this page because we have a background of white. And this is going to define our content, which is this one, the content, hold everything in it. And that's the image. Remove the scroller bar if there's any. This is how we define the preview image. We have a four preview image section, give them a box shadow. And also uh, a proper setting for our price, discount, current price, sizes, and a size item, that kind of things. Make sure the size has a hover effect. So once you've done that, you go back, you will see um, this thing looks slightly better, except that this part, uh, we haven't done it correctly. So I'm gonna uh, do a bit more setting. It seems like I have put all the details and the remaining stuff inside the uh, item price class name. So I'm just gonna cut, uh, cut all of these out. So make sure the item price only contain the item price information. And then down below, I put in that detail. So now everything has been placed to the correct position. If you go back to the browser, you will see that it looks much nicer. And this one is clickable, it will stay at 
the one that you chose. Clickable, clickable. Okay, so everything looks much much better. Uh, I give them a white background um, because uh, to show information uh, for the user to grab people's eyes, the white background works better than the dark scene. And this one is done. The remaining one is going to be the quantity. So we have to define the quantity thing for the user to choose how many they want. So what I will do, I'll copy and paste in and explain the code over here. Give it a title quantity, give them a class name. So the key thing is here, when you have the quantity, you must ha have the uh, plus sign and also the, the minus sign that will allow the user to increase and decrease the quantity of the item. So we write two functions. The minus sign matches the decrease quantity function and the plus sign matches the increase quantity function. So we're going to write those two functions. Right above, after the handle size changes, I'm going to show you two functions. We think that uh, it seems going to be very easy to handle the quantity, which is not. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things for you to think about. The quantity cannot go below 1 and it cannot go beyond 99. So the thing is that you must define a state variable quantity first. So this is the state variable quantity. Initially, we set that quantity to 1. It's a default value. You're going to have to buy 1 uh, for the transaction to be processed. It cannot be 0, right? And the second thing is uh, we manage that quantity whenever the user um, click on the plus sign and the minus sign, we increase and decrease that status. How do we achieve that? And uh, the function is increase quantity. Well, first, we must say that uh, if the quantities go beyond the 99, we set the quantity to 99. That's like a protection and return. It means that we get out of this function. Nothing else is going to happen. All right. So the maximum is 99. So this line is not using right now. Let's remove that. Same for this. And for the decrease quantity, if the quantity go below 2, go below 2 basically means that's 1, we set it to 1. Stay at 1. And we get out of the, the function. Nothing else is going to happen. Otherwise, we'll keep just reducing the quantity and reset the quantity to status. All right. So this is the idea, the logic behind it. And once you have that, going back to the browser, you will see that quantity button there. If you click, this one will keep increasing. If you minus, this one will keep reducing. But when you reach 1, you cannot go even smaller to 0. It wouldn't allow you because we have this protection thing happening here. right? So this is the logic. And the last but not least is that we need to have a Add to Shopping Bag button over here. When the user click on that, they choose the, the, the size, they choose the quantity. And they add to the back, this thing should go to the back. Alright? So the last thing we want to do is to create that component, add to back. So down here. Found a quantity class. Below that, we add one button. Um, add to back. So we have to let the user know or let the computer know which item they want to add it to the back and show the relevant information in the back as well. Okay, so inside this component, I create a function called add handle add to back and I pass in the item that we want to add in. Okay, so right above, we have to write that function accordingly. So what I will do, I'll, I'll create that function. So, so far, I just say console.log item. So, whatever item you passed in, the item will be uh, added to the back. Okay? But the thing is, you think about it, the thing we pass in is going to be a problem. If you look at the original object, the original item object only contains the information of the price and all of this. It does not contain the information of the sizes and also the quantity. The size and quantity information will only be created during the process of this page, the item detail page, right? So we cannot just pass in the original item as the information to the shopping bag. It will be incomplete. We need these two information, quantity and size. So the way to handle this is that I create a new state variable right over here, this one. I create a new state variable called item edit and a set item edit. Uh, this is going to be the item added to the shopping bag eventually. And the initial state of it is just we copy 
whatever we have done for the item, but we add on the quantity property and also the size property. The default value has been added. Okay, and whenever we change that, we should also trigger on this uh, the the change to the item added as well. So say for example, when we fetch the data from the backend over here, instead of a set item to that specific object, we should also set the item added to that specific object as well. Otherwise, it will be incomplete. So here we just add one more line, set item added to that data. We copy that, and whatever you have, we copy that, and also we set the quantity to one, and we um, set the size to m. So now you have a new object, but this new object contains two more information, quantity and size, which the original one you don't have them. All right. So that's one place we want to add them. The remaining place we want to add them, uh, I have just commented out, and now I'm just gonna release them. So I release this one. Whenever you change the size, you're gonna change that uh, um, item to be added to shopping bag as well, to the new size. Whenever you increase the quantity or decrease the quantity, you're gonna update the quantities inside of the item to be added to the shopping bag as well. So this one is all changed accordingly. So now things is getting good, okay? And I think the more proper way to do Maybe we re put this two line of code. Um, let's see, right above everything, because logically we should fetch data first. Once we fetch data, we can do the remaining handling. That'll probably make things even better. Yep. So we're going back. See if it's working. Yeah, it's still working. We're on number two. Things working. This one's working. This one's working. So now I'm just gonna open it up my terminal. This is the uh, the console. I remove this. I'm on extra large. I'm on that. Add to back. Let's see if it can give us the in enough information. We have that um, information all there. We have the quantity too. We have the size extra large. Perfect. So now you can see when we click on the add to back button, the actual item object gets passed on is the one that have been uh, updated with the quantity and the size information. Otherwise, it will be incomplete. We must have the complete information for the product to be added to the shopping bag. All right, that's what it is for. Done. And uh, last but not least, the thing is that I want to have one more button down below this add to back button. Uh, because when the user look at it, they probably want to keep browsing other products and they, they want to leave the page and they don't know how to do it. So we give them a convenience by saying that you have a keep browsing and we use that uh, anchor link from the React to DOM, import that, so done that. Make sure it has been imported. Yeah, done. So now we have a another button there. Keep browsing. Once the user click on it, it will take the user back to the home page. So they can click on this one. This is the third one. Shop now. It shows the information of the third item. Okay, all there. They can choose the size. They can choose the quantity. They can add to back or otherwise they keep browsing going back. Okay. So this is the thing uh, that's supposed to be done. All right. So now we have uh, done pretty much um, the product detailed page. And uh, the next of us to do is to create our shopping bag and also finalize our uh, um, collection item. So that's uh, probably going to take another session of the video. So what I will do, I will uh, stop our today's session here. And uh, in the next session, I will show you uh, how to continue this project by building that uh, shopping cart or the shopping bag. Whenever the user click on add to bag, this item should pop into that shopping bag. And also the number of that item in the shopping bag should be dynamic based on how many things you have added. And also in the next video, I will also show you the, uh, the collection bag. Once the user, say for example, in the home page, click on this uh, um, bookmark, this thing should be added to your uh, collection back as well. So in the next video, I will show you that. So that'll wrap up today's video. If you do like my uh, um, instruction, please subscribe to my channel, like it and share it. And then hopefully I will see you in the next video to finalize this entire project. Thank you all for watching.